Got another riddle for you. So here I have a mass, uh, a couple of masses hooked up with some pulleys. I've got a big mass down here, tiny mass down here. Uh, here is a 50 gram mass. This one's about 550. So this is about 10 times as much as this mass is. Uh, and I've got a pulley attached to my big mass, uh, and I can move this up and down just by pulling down on my string here. And what I want to know is how much mass do I have to add to this pulley in order to get this mass to move up? So here we go. I've got a 550 gram mass here, a 50 gram mass here. Uh, I also have a bunch of 100 gram masses here. So my question for you is, how many of these 100 gram masses will I have to stack onto my 50 gram mass in order for this thing to come down? All right, hopefully you've all made a guess at this point. Let's start stacking masses. Here we go. One mass. Two masses, and there it goes. Now, here's an interesting dilemma. So I have 250 grams here. I have 550 grams here. Why is it that 250 grams is heavy enough to pull up 550 grams? So uh, pulleys confer a mechanical advantage to lifting an object. And basically, they make lifting an object easier. How do they do that? Well, suppose uh, I've got 100 uh, Newton weight here. So the force of gravity is pulling down uh, with 100 Newton. So it's about a, a, uh, a 10 kilogram weight, uh, about 20 pounds. And uh, force of gravity is pulling down with 100 Newtons. And for Newtons. And I attach a string to that weight. The string is going to go up and around a pulley. Uh, and I want to know how much force I have to pull down with to lift that weight. Well, I know, as we said, it's 100 Newton weight, so gravity is pulling down with a force of 100 Newtons. And I am pulling down with some tension. I'm over here. I'm pulling down with some tension. As I pull down with some tension, that tension is going to get transferred uh, to the block, and so the block is also going to feel some tension. And if I'm going to lift that block up, I need to have at least 100 newtons of force in order to counteract gravity. Okay. So in this case, I haven't really gained any mechanical advantage. Right? Gravity is pulling down with 100 newtons. I've got to lift up with 100 newtons in order uh, to get the box to, to rise up. It's the same thing if I were just lifting it by bending my knees, grabbing the box, and picking it up. Um, I still need 100 newtons. I need exactly the same amount of force as I had, uh, as I have pulling down with gravity. Now let's take a different scenario. Suppose I still have a 100 newton weight, still 100 newtons, yeah, but this time what I do is I connect a string to the ceiling and I tie that string and I make it come down around through a pulley that I've attached to my 100 Newton weight. Uh, the string goes around the pulley, comes up through another pulley, and then comes back down. So again, it's like I'm on a pull-down machine. I'm going to pull this weight, I'm going to pull this string down, and then the weight is going to rise up. What's going to happen in this case? Well, again, We've got gravity pulling down with the force of 100 newtons. Again, I'm over here pulling the string down, applying some tension. Uh, but this time, the tension I apply is a little bit different. Because I have two strings that are both pulling up. They're both pulling up on the weight, which means I have two tensions that I'm pulling with. So in this case, I will get a different tension. I'll call this uh, T2. Now I only have to pull with 50 newtons because I have two spots that are pulling up with that force. 
So I have to pull, in this case, with only 50 newtons, because that force is going to get distributed, distributed on the two different uh, sides of the pulley, because I have two strings that are both pulling up with some tension. So we've got a 50 newton force, a 50 newton force, and that will counteract the 100 newton force. So here, in this case, where I have the pulley attached to the object, I have to pull with half as much force as I did in this case, where I had only one string attached to the object. So the question is, why does it seem like I'm getting something for nothing? It seems like I apply less force here than I do here. Um, and very rarely do you get something for free. What's the trade-off that I have in this situation? Well, here's what's going to happen. Suppose I'm over here, in case one, pulling down on my string, pulling with 100 newtons. Suppose I pull my string down one meter. Okay, so it's about this far. I pull my string down one meter on this side. Well, if I have taken one meter down on this side, that means I had to lose one meter of rope on this side which means the box has to go up one meter. If I pull down one meter on this side, the box goes up one meter. It turns out it's a little bit different on this side. Again, let's say I pull my rope down, I pull it down one meter. When I do that, the box, it turns out, in this case, is not going to go up one meter. Because, just like before, if I pull one meter of rope to this side, to this side of the pulley, that means I have to lose one meter of rope on that side. If I'm uh, just because the rope is uh, going to stay the same length. If I pull one meter on this side, I have to lose one meter on that side. But I have two strings here, which means half of that one meter, half a meter, is going to come from this side, and half of that meter, uh, half of that meter that I pulled down of rope, is going to come from that side. Which means. As this rope slides over the pulley, this block is only going to go up half a meter. Okay? Because again, I'm, just like I'm distributing the force, I'm also distributing the amount of rope that I'm pulling. So that half a meter of rope is going to come from the left side, half a meter of rope is going to come from the right side. So we pay this extra cost because I have to pull the rope further, even though I'm getting more force. Okay? If I pull the rope, um, if I get twice as much force, I have to pull the rope twice as far as the compensation. All right. Now we've talked about how you don't get something for nothing. You might get more force by adding a pulley, but that means you're going to have to pull the rope further. Um, so something is being conserved there. In this case, um, what we want to look at is a quantity called work. So let's look at the work that I'm actually doing on an object and see if we can um, figure out what's being conserved here. So in this case, we are pulling with a force of 100 newtons. So this is the force of me on the rope. I am pulling this rope down with a force of 100 newtons. And over here, I'm pulling only with a force of 50 newtons because again, I'm just pulling to give the rope some tension. So here, my force is 50 newtons. And as we've discussed, in this case, let's suppose I pull the rope down one meter. So we would say the rope, maybe that segment of rope goes down, goes down by one meter. Over here, same segment of rope going down, this time, it only goes down half an, or excuse me, I have to pull it twice as far, so it has to go two meters. This piece of rope is going to go two meters. All right, well, it's pretty clear to see what's the same in both cases. If I take, I'm going to define my work this way. I'm going to see the work is the product of the force times the distance. So I'm pulling with 100 newton force over one meter. So in this case, that would be 100 newtons in one meter would be 100 newton meters of work. Let's see what happens in this case. In this case, again, just taking the same 
definition for my work is force times distance. Except this time, I am pulling with a 50 Newton force, and I'm pulling it 2 meters. Well, again, taking force times distance, except 50 times 2 is 100 Newton meters, just like it was in the previous case. Okay. So in both cases, I still have to do the same amount of work to get the block to go up. So in this case, I have to do the same amount of work to get the block to go up the same distance. If I want the block to travel up one meter, I only have to pull one meter on this side. But when I have a pulley, I have to pull it down, I have to pull my rope down two meters to get the block to go up one meter. So if I want my 100 Newton block to go up, I have to do the same amount of work in both cases. So work is going to be a very important quantity in physics uh, because it's the same in both cases. That mean, means it's got to be, there's got to be something special about work. What is it that's special about this work that we're doing on the object? Before going into what's important about work, I want to give a more precise definition. So we said that the work done on an object is equal to the force times uh, the distance that the object has traveled. Now it's a very particular type of force, so I want to um, I want to comment on that. Let's, the best way to see it is to take an example. So say say you're uh, pulling a suitcase, and you're pulling that suitcase with some force. So you're pulling with some force. Uh, but you're pulling it at an angle, so you're maybe pulling it up at a 45 degree angle. Well, we can label that 45 degree angle. We'll call that angle theta. And as you pull uh, with that force, your object moves some distance delta x. Well, we would say that the work done on the object is the force that you pull with times delta x. But again, it's a very particular type of force that we're concerned with. Turns out we're not concerned with the total force. We're only concerned with the force that is parallel to the direction of motion. So if I am moving to the right, I want to know how much force I am pulling with to the right. Now you might say, well, you're not pulling to the right, Santos. You're pulling up and to the right. That's correct. So what we need to do is we need to break this force into how much force do I pull with to the right and how much force do I pull with up. To do that, what we can do is I can make two triangles, or uh, just one triangle actually, but I'm going to be concerned with the two sides of that right triangle. There's going to be part of the right triangle in this case, the right-hand side, the side opposite to theta, that is going to represent the amount of force that I am pulling up. There is going to be a bottom side of this triangle. In this case, the side that's adjacent to that angle. That will tell me the amount of force that I am pulling to the right. Actually, let me label that. I'll label that in white just because I'm not sure if purple will show up on camera. Um, so I, I can break my force into two different forces, the amount of force that I pull with up and the amount of force that I pull with to the right. Well, how big are those sides of that triangle? We can figure that out using trigonometry. So recall, we have this relationship in trigonometry called Sokato that says if I uh, want to know what a cosine of an angle is, well, that's defined as the adjacent side to that angle. In this case, the adjacent side is f bar t, divided by the hypotenuse, in this case, uh, the total force f. So that if I wanted to find how much force I pull with to the right, I would be solving for that adjacent side of the triangle would mean I'd have to move the hypotenuse over to the other side. The hypotenuse is just the total force F. D 
the, uh, and I would have to multiply by the cosine of the angle. So to get the force on the right side of that triangle, I would have to say the force pulling to the right is just the total force times the cosine of the angle. If I wanted to find the force pulling up, what I could do is I could note that that force is on the opposite side of this angle. So here's my angle. If I look at the side that's opposite to the angle, I get the force pulling up. And I can solve my uh, sine equation that comes from Sokato. In this case, it's the so, saying that the sine is the opposite of over the hypotenuse. The so, uh, tells me how I can solve for the opposite side. I just have to move my hypotenuse over to the other side. So if I want to find how big f up is, f up is the opposite side. So I would move my hypotenuse over to the side. In this case, I would get f, and it would be times the sine of theta. So I get two forces here. Force pulling to the right and the force pulling up. The one I'm concerned with is the force that's pulling parallel to the direction of motion. In this case, the force to the right. So if I want to compute the work, what I need to do is I need to look at how much force is actually pulling in the direction that I'm moving. So why is work so important? It turns out work is very fundamental. Uh, and it's fundamental because we have this thing called the work energy theorem. So it turns out that if I look at the amount of work that you do on an object, that is going to equal the change in the amount of energy that that object has. So work is going to equal delta E, where E is this thing that we call energy. The easiest way to see how the work energy theorem applies is to do an example. Uh, so suppose I have a block of mass M, say it's on a frictionless surface, uh, let's say I'm pulling it with some force F, and I'm going to do that for some distance delta X. Well, my work energy theorem says that the amount of work that I do on an object is equal to the change in the energy. Let's see what that actually means. First of all, let's just consider this uh, how in the normal way that I would with forces. So how would this object move? Well, I would sum up the forces. I've already made a free body diagram. It's only got that one force on it. Uh, I would sum up the forces. I would say that is equal to F, which is just equal to the mass times the acceleration which would mean that my acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass of the object. I'm just going to stick in variables right now. Uh, I'll stay in variables uh, just so we can do this in the most general way possible. Um, so I know what my acceleration is, but what if I wanted to know how fast my, ma my mass was moving? What if I wanted to know its final velocity after it was done accelerating? Well, I could plug into one of my kinematic equations. I could say that V final squared minus V initial squared uh, equals 2 times the acceleration times delta x. I could say, uh, suppose we started from rest, so zero. I could say that my final velocity squared was equal to 2 A times delta x. But my acceleration is equal to the force over the mass. So that would be, I could plug in my force divided by my mass. And you'll notice here that I have work right here. Force times delta x. Force in the direction of motion times that delta x. Let's solve for our work. We would say that the work is just that force times delta x. That has to equal the change in the energy. Uh, 
I would have to move the 2 and the m over to the other side. That would be 1 half the mass times the velocity squared. So this must be some type of energy. Uh, 1 half mass times velocity squared must be the change in the energy of that object. Turns out that's a very particular type of energy. We're going to have several different types of energy here. And in this case, what I have done is I have caused my object, my mass, to move. So this would be what we call kinetic energy. Kinetic just means the energy of motion. So when I do work on this object, I get some change in the energy. In this case, that energy happens to be kinetic energy. So the work done, this is a special case. In other cases, we might get a different type of energy when I do work. I've done some work. I've gotten some change in the energy. And in this case, we're going to define the kinetic energy to be 1 half mass times velocity I won't call it final velocity. I'll just call it velocity squared. Because this formula will generally be true for our kinetic energy. If I want to look at how much energy an object has, how much kinetic energy, I just take one half its mass times whatever its velocity is squared. We've talked about the work energy theorem. We said that the amount of work I do on an object tells me what the change in the energy of that object is. All right. Well, what are the units of work and what are the units of energy? Well, they should get the same units since work is just equal to the change in energy. Uh, and I know, if I look at the work equation, force, we measure that in newtons. And distance, we measure in meters. So I could say that the units of energy are newtons times meters. Equivalently, if I go over to kinetic energy, I know the unit of mass is kilograms. I know the units of velocity are meters per second. And I have to square that because velocity is squared. So I could say the units of energy are kilograms, meters squared divided by seconds squared. These two are completely equivalent, so I'll put a big equal sign there. Uh, and both of those are kind of a mouthful, so let's give this a nickname. We will say the energy units are J, which stands for joules. So a joule, uh, our energy units will be joules. Um, a joule is either a newton meter or equivalently a kilogram meter squared per second squared.